Everybody, welcome to the Atheist Experience Live. I'm your host Matt Delaney, and your other host Russell Glasser. Hello. We are live today. is Sunday, January 29th, 2012. The Atheist Experience is a live public access television program sponsored by the Atheist Community of Austin. You can find out more about the ACA by visiting the website at www.atheist-community.org. There you'll find frequently asked questions page, uh, information about how to how to contact us, our email, which is tv at atheist-community.org, and uh, more about show, the shows and the events. And because there's more than one show, in addition to this program, we also sponsor a couple of audio-only podcasts, uh, Godless Bitches, which uh, I think is still recording on Tuesdays, maybe? It's Tuesdays or Wednesdays, but it gets out there. And then Nonprofits, which is supposed to be every Saturday, but those of you who follow it know that there wasn't one this Saturday. Actually, there won't be one for the next couple of Saturdays uh, because I'm moving to the south side of Austin, and that'll kind of put a, a crimp in our ability to run it. Uh, and once the ACA building's finally up and loaded out with audio equipment, that shouldn't happen anymore. It, it should take like an act of God to prevent us. And that certainly won't happen, yeah. so there. So we're, we're golden after that. Um, if, you, if you don't get through on the phone today or you don't want to, you can always uh, send us an email at tv at atheist-community.org. We'll have the telephone number up for you shortly. Uh, you can also check out more announcements at the website. But we're going to start off because Russell wants to talk to us about truth. Hey. How are you doing? I'm good. How it's are like you? It's like been forever since uh, you and I... The yeah, show. the last time was the Ray Comfort episode. Yeah. And I never get to sit in this chair, and that means I never get to pick the topic. So uh, today, I am picking the topic, which and is... I'm uh, going to sit here and pretend like I had anything at all to do with the show. <laughs> yeah. So uh, actually, talking about stuff like truth and postmodernism and journalism, uh, it, sounded, uh, it seemed like a good idea to me, but then it seemed like something I'd already done before. So sure enough, I looked it up, and Matt and I did a show which, which I titled To Tell the Truth. But then it was in 2006. So first I was like, Matt, we're old. Yeah. <laughs> and then I was like, well, six years is plenty of statute of limitation for, to hit the same topic again. So here we go. Considering we answer some of the same questions almost every week. Constantly. Hitting one topic over the course of six years is a uh, pretty good track record. Doing well. Um, so uh, a couple of weeks ago, the, the public editor of the New York Times posted uh, something. It was on the website. I'm not sure if it was also on the editorial page. But uh, Arthur S. Brisbane wrote something titled, Should the Times be a Truth Vigilante? Uh, Brisbane writes, uh, my question is what role the paper's hard news coverage should play with regard to false statements by candidates or by others. In general, the Times sets its documentations of, uh, documentations of falsehoods in articles apart from primary coverage. If the newspaper's overarching goal is truth, oughtn't the truth be embedded in its principal stories? In other words, if a candidate repeatedly utters an outright falsehood, I leave aside amb ambiguous implications. Shouldn't the Times coverage nail it right at the point where the article quotes it? That was actually a question from the, a, a reader, and Arthur Brisbane writes, I'm looking for reader input on whether and when the New York Times news reporter should challenge facts that are asserted by newsmakers they write about. One example mentioned recently by a reader, as cited in an Adam Liptak article on the Supreme Court, a court spokeswoman said Clarence Thomas had misunderstood a financial disclosure form when he failed to report his wife's earnings from the Heritage Foundation. The reader thought it not likely that Mr. Thomas misunderstood and instead that he simply chose not to report the information. Another example, on the campaign trail, 
Mitt Romney often says President Obama has made speeches apologizing for America, a phrase to which Paul Krugman objected in a December 23rd column, arguing that, the, that politics has advanced to the post-truth stage. As an op-ed columnist, Mr. Krugman clearly has the freedom to call out what he thinks is a lie. My question for readers is, should news reporters do the same? If so, then perhaps the next time Mr. Romney says the president has a habit for apologizing for his country, the reporter should insert a paragraph saying more or less, the president has never used the word apologize in a speech about U.S. policy or history. So what this guy is asking is, should the New York Times care about writing whether the stuff that it's saying is true or not? <laughs> And as you might expect, this met from some interesting reactions from readers in the comments. Uh, a couple of choice ones said, uh, let's see, the worst part is the opinion makers such as the Times are letting ignorance dominate the discussion. There's no valid argument against evolution, nor is there anything but consensus among scientists about global climate change. But doubt about both is beginning to dominate public, uh, public opinion because there is an impression that both sides disagree, or opinions vary. No, the truth is that the opinions of cranks and shills disagree with those of experts and should be portrayed that way. Another comment, as someone who graduated with a BA in journalism back in the days of typewriters, I'm speechless and horrified that the Times needs to ask that question. Has the Times for... Uh, has the times uh, that they've forgotten the most basic tenets of journalism? Of course, reporters slash editors have to question and find the facts and truth. You don't choose to correct one side over the other. You check both sides for accuracy. If the truth shows that one side is correct, the public needs to know this. The Times can't allow itself to be bullied by people who like to ignore facts. Do we need to remind you of Watergate yet again? So the readers have some pretty harsh words uh, for the times, and I think, well, they should. But uh, you might well ask, um, how are the poor writers at the New York Times supposed to know what the truth is? I mean, isn't everything subjective? Um, that's something that postmodernists tend to think. Uh, and even in, uh, some, in an establishment that we here on the Atheist Experience regard very highly, science, we like to hammer again and again the fact that there is no absolute certainty about truth or reality in science. Everything is tentative. Everything is uh, basically subject to change. And of course, apologists love to hammer on that point and say, oh, you can't trust science. Everything's always changing. What you knew last week might not be the same next week, right? Um, but even without having this idea of absolute certainty about the truth, science manages to come a lot closer to reality than, than uh, any track record that religion has. I mean, I, I like to talk in the past about, uh, you know, ancient Egyptians believing that the sun uh, gets carried across the sky in Ra's barge, and that's, uh, and that's why it moves across the sky. Um, but science um, is a methodology where you don't just accept the stuff that's been handed down as common wisdom, but you, uh, you, know, you continue to investigate facts, uh, and you learn more, and if, something, uh, and if something you learn happens to overturn some long-cherished belief that you had, then uh, you replace that belief. Um, now, there's also this movement called postmodernism, which sort of jumps on that fact that, uh, that nothing about the truth is certain. Um, and postmodernists like to say that actually there is no real objective truth. And in fact, they're no friend to science because they say, uh, you know, actually science is just another religion, that, that it's the modern religion that people believe unquestioningly. Um, <sighs> apologists hate postmodernism and science with about equal fervor. Um, 
I remember reading Chuck Colson's book, The Faith, a few years ago. Uh, he, he sent it to me so we could have a discussion on the blog, uh, which you can still look up. Um, and one of the first things that caught my eye in his book, The Faith, uh, was a section entitled Postmodernism and the Death of Truth. Now, Chuck Colson wrote, what's really at issue here is a dramatic shift in the prevailing belief of Western cultural elites. We have come into a postmodern era that rejects the idea of truth itself. If there is no such thing as truth, then Christianity's claims are inherently offensive and even bigoted against others. Tolerance, falsely defined as putting uh, all propositions on an equal footing, as opposed to giving ideas an equal hearing, has replaced truth. Now it's weird, but this is a place where I think Matt and I find a lot of common cause with apologists. <laughs> Am I right? Because postmodernists are really annoying. <laughs> um, they say that, that basically there is no such thing as, uh, as any kind of truth. And, uh, and if you listen to any apologist long enough, not Chuck Colson, they will uh, make a complaint, which I think is actually legitimate, where they come in and they say, um, well, people these days, they think your truth is your truth and my truth is my truth and, uh, you know, and we just have to agree to disagree about everything. And I think that's kind of where, unfortunately, <laughs> the New York Times has sort of landed with this, with this claim that they shouldn't have to be truth vigilantes. But what's really ironic about the way that Chuck Colson talks about truth um, is that when we got into a, an email exchange, uh, one of the first things he wrote back to me was, um, all thought begins with faith, and intellectual inquiry begins with certain presuppositions. These, by necessity, are made without evidence and have to be taken on faith. The idea that evidence is superior to faith as a route to knowledge is one of these presuppositions. It is uh, unproven and non-provable, so it must be taken as a priori. That is, prior to experience, or in other words, on faith. So Chuck Colson is concerned about what's true, but what he's really concerned about is getting back to this pre-science kind of truth, where you just decide ahead of time what's true, and you don't go looking, after, uh, looking for evidence. If you think that Ra pulls the sun across the sky, then you keep thinking that forever. Well, I, when I, you know, it's, it's not just ironic. Yeah. It's tragically ironic because while he's railing against postmodernists, he is one. Exactly. In his own sense. That that's exactly the thing, and this this happens with a lot of evangelists. I mean, for, Matt, I'm sure you'll remember that when we talked to Ray Comfort, uh, this bit came up in the conversation where Ray Comfort was was confidently saying, you know, the reason people should listen to me is because you guys already say you don't know insert your claim here, how the universe right. started. And I do know. That's what Ray Comfort said. And I said, no, you don't. And he said, yes, I do. And I said, no, you don't. And it kind of went back and forth a little bit like that because Ray Comfort's shtick, like a lot of apologists, is to claim that truth is really important to him. Uh, but he's got a funny way of looking for truth. Uh, he, uh, he just makes his decision about what's true, uh, and then uh, the evidence is not really an issue. In fact, we've had arguments before with, with like some more amateur apologists where we start talking about, well, like, what's your evidence for God? That's a common question on the show. And the apologists uh, have been known to just make fun of that, saying, oh, evidentialism. That's your point of view. We don't need, you know, that, that's like just a philosophical position that's unmaintainable. They, they say it, as, you know, evidentialism, as if giving a name to it makes it invalid automatically. But what's the alternative? Um, cer certainly, uh, there's a big difference in the success rate between trying to test your beliefs versus 
just believing any old nonsense you make up. Because when you look at the big, wide world of stuff that people believe, uh, you know, we always bring up the alternate religions like, you know, Islam. How do I know those guys who, uh, you know, think that they'll be rewarded in heaven for being martyrs are wrong? Maybe they're right. Maybe you, Mr. Christian, are headed for hell because uh, you're not sufficiently Muslim. Or, or like South Park said, uh, uh, the Mormons got it right. Um, if, there, if there's no alternative to faith, then, uh, then, like Matt said, we're right back in the position of dealing with postmodernists where, for people who think that they're talking about absolute truth. So, getting back to journalism, science doesn't have it absolutely right when it comes to finding truth, um, but what they've done is they've come up with the best methodology that anybody has, uh, has ever come up with for discovering realities about the universe and finding out incredible stuff about the universe that we live in. And they do it by being open to criticism all the time, by forthrightly stating, well, our best evidence points here, but then being ready for new evidence to come in and being ready to issue a correction, so to speak. And what I feel like newspapers have gotten worse at in the last few decades is actually uh, being bold about stating a point of view that they came to through research. Uh, and, inst and instead of doing the kind of research that, I mean, you know, no journalism could be a hard science like physics or chemistry, but you could certainly do due diligence and uh, submit things to review from other journalists and check things out against, uh, uh, against relatively reliable sources. And when you have a New York Times, when you have a paper like the New York Times saying, well, we don't want to be vigilantes for truth. We're just writing down what people say. They're kind of wasting your time because uh, they're, they're willing. They're basically they're putting themselves on the same footing as like the Weekly World News. Exactly. If you're not going to verify your sources, what's the point? Why would anybody trust you as as a reliable? Right, and and not just the New York Times is available. Uh, you know, more and more people are getting information through blogs, and some of them are horrendous, and some of them are not. Um, but, you know, you as, as a reader can uh, sort of pick and choose your sources and figure out which ones seem to be applying a sort of scientific-like message. And I would hope that the reason that the New York Times expects to be one of, the, one of the dwindling few sources that's actually paid to uncover this stuff for you is that they do it better than anybody else. Because I don't need the New York Times to report what a candidate says, because anybody with an iPhone can do that. Um, so, as, you know, here on the Atheist Experience, we're always very concerned about figuring out what's real. We're, we're always asking what people believe and why, and that why is very important, and it seems to be something that newspapers are unfortunately losing sight of. Cool. Well, we're going to go ahead and start taking callers. Uh, as a reminder, since I didn't mention the announcements, after the show's over, we get together for dinner uh, at El Arroyo at 5th and Campbell. Uh, I'm sure they'll pop the address up on the screen as soon as they realize I finally woke up and mentioned it. There it is. Uh, any atheist or atheist-friendly person is welcome to come to that event or any of our other events. Uh, you don't have to be a member, uh, but please don't come down and, I don't know, make a scene, create a fuss, whatever. Uh, we got a bunch of callers on the line and only... Like 30, 30 minutes. 40 minutes or so at 38 and a half or something like that. So let's get started with Artie and Charlotte. How are you? Hey, good. How are you guys doing? Pretty hey, good. how are you? Good, good. Hey, I'm not going to take up a whole lot of your time because uh, I'm, I'm an atheist and agnostic as well. And um, But I, I just wanted to run something by you. I, I was listening to a, a debate um, between uh, Mike Lycona and uh, Richard Carrier. Mm -hmm. And one of the... Uh, things that Mike Lacona said was that the appearance of Jesus to Paul and to the apostles was proof of the resurrection. How can you call something proof if you can't confirm it happened at all? Well, right, right. I, you know, and, and it's interesting that Russell is on today because uh, I've heard him make reference to uh, 
Douglas Adams um, Hitchhiker's Guide, where he talks about the Vogons and um, so you know, transmitting their, uh, you know, their um, their message to the whole planet about their intentions. Were you emailing us last week? Just curious. No, 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 no. Oh, that's a coincidence. Uh, actually, I just I just called okay. in today. All right. Um, but but anyway, my I guess my point is, and I can I can take it off the air, but my my point is. Uh, why would God have not um, made his attention known to a much larger group of people? I don't know. Yeah, yeah I mean, Maybe you can find him and ask him. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of the many things that I find very curious. I mean, if you think about, if you look at Christianity in the, in the big picture, you purportedly have this being who has an important message for everybody, and yet he communicates it in the most uh, inefficient and uh, kind of fungible ways possible of delivering it to a handful of people who reported in languages that surely this being must know are going to die out, be subject to interpolations and forgeries and stuff. And, and it's like a, the Bible's like a comedy of errors. Things just keep going wrong for this guy, and he keeps trying to fix it, including let's wipe everybody off the face of the earth and hit the reset button, and oh, crap, that failed. So now I'm just going to pick one group of people, uh, and then, oh, I'm going to you know come down and take human form and be a sacrifice to myself to act as a loophole for rules that I created, uh, yet there, I'm going to leave behind no reliable evidence for that sort of event. So, I mean, is, if he exists, he's a buffoon. I mean, there's no, uh, you know, oh, you know, I'm sure I've, I'm going to irritate a bunch of Christians of, oh, you're, you're placing yourself above God. You bet your ass. I'm way above <laughs> the guy that, you, that your book describes, both with regard to my moral positions and, and I'd have to say intellect. And I, how dumb do you have to be to, to have this comedy of errors occur? So <laughs> it, I agree with you that it's, it's absurd. Oh, I, I'm going to let them kill me, and then I'm going to come back, and I'm not going to offer evidence, but I'm going to appear to a couple people here and there, and they're not going to be able to offer supporting evidence. It's like he doesn't <clears throat> understand the very nature of reason as it applies to the universe or the way the brains that he purportedly gave us work. It's an ingenious plan. Right, right. And, and I guess the last thing I was going to say was if the message was so important, why wouldn't he let a much larger audience know about it? Right. You well, know, why just uh, one guy, Paul, and then a few apostles? So, you know, why not, you know, like the Vogons and Hitchhiker's Guide, you know, why not let Beaming the whole a message world know to all of Earth simultaneously you know? was the point of that. Uh, it, it's been posited before as a bit of a, as a, bit of a joke that, in fact, uh, a God exists, but the actual test that it's conducting is one of uh, intelligence and critical thinking and to see who's going to be gullible or not. <laughs> yeah, that would be a good fake out. Look, the Bible may not just be a book written by a bunch of local ignorant sheep herders uh, who were writing about stuff within their very limited experience uh, to each other and writing down some extremely ignorant laws that just happened to sound good at the time. But if it isn't, then uh, God sure made a lot of effort to make it look like it. <laughs> it's kind of like something James Randi once said to uh, Yuri Geller, the spoonbender guy. He said he could do it through magic, but he'd be doing it the hard way. Yeah. Uh, and same thing with the Bible. Uh, you know, the Bible could be magical, but it sure looks like a bunch of, uh, a bunch of primitive um, tribesmen writing down stuff that sounds good to them. Right. Hey, well, thanks a lot, guys. I uh, appreciate everything you guys do, and uh, keep up the hard work. Sure. Thanks, Artie. All right. Thanks, man. We've got <clears throat> Athens and San Antonio. How are you? Pretty good. How are you guys? Well, I'm doing well. All right, well, um, just a quick bit of background. I do have to work at five, so I'll make this this fast. But I was raised Mormon, and both of my sides of the family are like 99% Mormon. So I grew up in that, and I'm an atheist. Now. So, um, you know, since that happened, I've kind of lost the entire social network. Um, my parents kicked me out like the day I told them, and. Um, I, you know, my my employer found out, and so now I'm only working two days a week. I'm mm -hmm. sleeping in my car and stuff. So I just wanted to caution atheists that might be in the closet um, to be really careful about the timing. You know, I don't regret 
um, being honest with my family and, and anything like that, but I do regret the timing of it. Yeah, uh, it's, it's something we talked about before. Keep an eye out. Um, Jerry DeWitt, who's now running uh, Recovering Religionists, um, we're hoping to have him on the show in the near future. Um, and that's an organization that people coming out, that especially those that have had a difficult time of it, uh, can take advantage of to help build a new social network. But you're absolutely right, and it's one of the reasons why we, we've recommended to people for years now <laughs> that, you know, uh, if you're going to come out, make sure that you're aware of what the consequences are and that you're prepared to deal with them you, because it's, it's very possible in some situations that you will become... Uh, ostracized by everybody that you currently interact with, and right. you may actually risk, you know, your career uh, and other things. I, I've been kind of fortunate, having done the show for a number of years, uh, to work with people where that's not a problem, and um, also my family. Um, we things will never get back to the the way what was normal before, but we've kind of established a new normal, and we all get along. And you know, they were at the wedding, and I talk to my dad regularly. Um, and, you know, we're looking forward to, to interacting in the future. It's just they've kind of left it in God's hands, and I'm happy that they have because <laughs> now we can actually interact about other things. You know, this, my, my position on religion doesn't define everything about who I am, and, it, and I think part of it was them realizing that while they are still convinced that I'm working for Satan, by and large, I'm not a different person or, or dramatically different or a worse person than the individual that they raised, and so we all still love each other. Um, yeah. Also, I, I would like to mention that there is a San Antonio... Uh, wait, you're in San Antonio, you said? Yes. Yeah, there is a San Antonio atheist group, and uh, they're, they're on, uh, what is it, sa-atheist.org. Um, you might want to check them out. Um, like Matt said, atheists don't have a do not lie commandment that they have to stick to. And while it's generally better to tell the truth, uh, I, I mean, everybody can see from your example that it's a good idea to be cautious and, and uh, consider it really carefully before you uh, decide to come out to people who in some way control your future. So you're right about that. Um, but... Uh, it, it would be a good idea maybe to hang out with this atheist group if for no other reason than, uh, you know, it's, it's always good to network in any way you can, and these are people who will probably be sympathetic to your situation, and if anyone knows about a job opening somewhere, then, uh, then it would be good to be in touch with them. In the meantime, though, you've got two minutes to get to work, and I don't want you to lose a job over us, so yeah. we'll talk to you later. All right, thank you, guys. Cheers. Bye. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, there's a bunch of different organizations, a bunch of ways to, uh, you know, people that you can interact with. And we're, the atheist community as a whole, I think, is getting better at kind of community building. and, and Yeah, we have a ways to go. Yeah. But uh, I, I think we're headed in the right direction. And, and the other aspect of that is, um, yeah, there's a bunch of risk and there's potentially a bunch of reward. I don't, you know, I, I really, there's relationships that I've lost, there's relationships that are now strained. Um, I don't regret it at all because I, I benefit from being honest about who I am uh, and it you know, feels great and I haven't, I haven't suffered some of the consequences that no, other people have. Not everyone can be an inter international internet TV star. Yeah. But, <laughs> but the, the big thing is about the, this idea of lying. Uh, I, I will assert right now that there are times where the most moral thing you can do is to lie. Uh, there's, you know, the classic example of Anne Frank hiding up, upstairs. Mm -hmm. um, Sam Harris has come out with a book on lying where uh, he's advocating that no one, no one ever tell a lie um, and that there are alternatives to lying. Um, I think on some level he's actually correct that in those situations like the Anne Frank situation there are alternatives to it. I just don't always think they're practical and I think that if telling the truth exposes uh, you to danger, harm, loss, um, or makes your life miserable, uh, then you're not obligated to tell, to tell the truth. So. All right, so we've got, um, oh, okay. Hmm. Daniel in New York, how are you? Hi, how are you today? Good, thanks for calling. Good, um, I just wanted to, uh, I've been watching you guys for a while, um, I, uh, I'm really impressed how you put the show together and everything you guys talk about. Um, I'm a sort of a physics aficionado on cosmology, physics, 
evolution. I, I read a lot about it after work. I go to the library. I read all day. Mm-hmm. Um, I wanted to know, I have a question about evolutionary theory, and I'm, this is a genuine question. I'm not trying to uh, disillusion you guys and then attack you afterwards. Sure. I genuinely want to know the answer. Um, if I understand to the best of my understanding, evolution is simply basically about, I'll try to make it quick, uh, different mutations that occur in the genes, and then those genes are either passed on because they're sometimes um, more advantageous to the, to the organism. Small now, correction, small correction. It's not necessarily mutation, but uh, variation that drives the change. And mutation is just a, a larger, unusual change, variation. Okay, okay, these mutations or variations. Um, passed on through the gene pool and, um, and continuing on for, for millions of years, and, and that's, that's basically what happens. Is that correct? Sure. So in a nutshell. Okay, in a nutshell. Um, so my question is, these mutations or variations to occur, number one, when they occur, there's no, uh, there's no um, promise that they're going to continue to occur, number one, in the same, um, the same place of the DNA. So, for example, if there was a, a small animal that had a short neck and its neck was uh, lengthened, like the giraffe, let's say, mm-hmm. there's no guarantee that it's going to continue uh, to do that particular genetic component of the organism for millions of years. It might start changing and start giving it, Correct. Giving it a That's different right. characteristic. Correct. Right. So my question is how, so for, um, for evolution to really be true, we have to believe that Number one, I'm not even going to talk about abiogenesis because there's no real uh, popular theory about that. But we have to believe that abiogenesis occurred all over the earth, and no. then all no. these organisms consistently, advantageously continued to evolve up until this day. Is that correct? No. No. Okay. May I? Yeah. So, so how, um, how? There, there's not an assumption that. Uh, there, there's not an assumption that uh, uh, variation will be only in the good direction. Um, if you look at people, for instance, uh, we're all somewhere around, uh, you know, f- uh, five, six feet tall when we get older. Um, some people are anomalies. You know, there's a few outliers that are like four feet tall, and there's a few people that are like seven or eight feet tall, right? But there's nobody who's like two inches tall. You see what I'm saying? So, okay, so when there's variation, there's variation around a central point. You know, you know what a bell curve is, right? Yeah. Okay, so the, the key thing to understand is that individuals don't evolve, but populations evolve. And so uh, let's say that it's, uh, for some reason, it's good to be taller and it's, and it's uh, dangerous to be shorter for some reason. It might not be very dangerous. It might just be that someone who's six feet tall has a, you know, has a 1% greater survival rate than someone who's five feet tall. You with me so far? Yes. Okay. If that happened, not all the four foot tall people would die, right? Um, you know, uh, but what would happen is that the four foot tall people would tend to die slightly earlier, uh, and there would be slightly, very slightly, more six foot tall people um, who happen to make it to childbearing age and pass on their genes. And what happens is that children tend to resemble their parents. So if you're the child of a taller parent, you're more likely to be closer to that six foot mark than to that four foot mark. So over a number of years, what will happen is that the population of humans as a whole will maybe drift up a centimeter at a time. But then you spread that out over you know millions of years, and what you have is a drift that eventually, uh, I mean, reaches an equilibrium point or if you know, or if it turns out that being taller is always better, which it's generally not, um, then they'll then over millions of years they'd eventually grow to be ten feet tall or whatever. In other words, it doesn't rely on one lucky mutation, and it doesn't rely on everybody mutating the same way. What it relies on is is a gradual drift uh, in features where children resemble their parents. And because the ones with disadvantageous features die slightly earlier on average, uh, the drift goes in the right direction. 
and, and actually, if I can kind of continue real quick, the point that I was objecting to was, was your claim that there needed to be multiple abiogenesis yeah, events happening all, all over the Earth. Um, that's not necessarily true. Um, and, and actually, the, the current thinking is that there was a single event, or at least the current uh, tree of life has spawned from a single event or a single pool of, you know, multiples happening in there. Um, there's been a lot of study on that, which, you know, since you didn't really go into I'll, I'll save that. I just wanted to point out that it's kind of interesting that you picked the giraffe um, to talk about uh, for a couple of reasons. One, you know, that Russell was talking about change happening in populations, and the, the, the deciding factor uh, of which uh, variations uh, ultimately propagate and which don't is this idea of natural selection. And at different times in different places, there are going to be different criteria for survival. And so if you have a population of creatures with a bunch where, where most of them are at about the same height, then the ones that are slightly taller that can reach the leaves have an advantage and can pass that on. And as long as that continues to be an advantage and there, there aren't other things to hinder that, then it's possible that within that population you see an elongated neck. Now, the giraffe neck is one that we, we can look at and it's, it isn't in the rock solid evidence against natural selection category. That, that I, I would say some other uh, uh, pieces of evidence are, like you know, the second chromosome, et cetera. But if you take a look at the, uh, the laryngeal nerve of the, of the giraffe, you can tell this is not intelligent design. It, it, it is something that, you know, in a, in a human or in smaller mammals, it's not a big problem for something to do this. And then as the neck gets longer, for it to run all the way up and come all the way back down and do this loop, that's just, I mean, that's absurd design. And it, it just speaks volumes about how this is natural selection favoring some traits without regard to others because it's not enough of a negative for that nerve to, to be so ridiculously long, um, even though there's a straight shot route. The idea that, you know, uh, uh, that an intelligent being has intelligently designed species you would think that there would be much better uh, design rather than this uh, a kind of sloppy reuse. Uh, I'd just like to make a point that when you say incredibly long or, or useless, what are you comparing it to being incredibly long to? There's no, there's no uh, consensus on the earth that people decided, you know, this is a good, a good size for a vein and this is, this is not. You know, it could be as long or as short as, as it needs to be. No, no, no. It's compared to the options. It, okay. I got an example for sure. you. Um, the human eye has a blind spot. Uh, squid eyes, am I, am I right about that one? Yeah. Don't have a blind spot. There are different ways that eyes can be so-called designed. Um, and the squid eye just objectively works better. I mean, squids can detect more, uh, you know, they, they can see better in general. And there's no particular reason that the human eye design would have had to be in humans particularly instead of some similar variation of squid eyes. It's just that they come from different lineages and the, and the vision of humans and squids evolved on separate tracks and humans just happen to end up with the worse ones. Yeah, but hang on, hang on just a second, because your, your, your question about, you know, who's deciding what's better. Um, the laryngeal nerve of the giraffe starts at the base of the brain, runs all the way down that long neck underneath the heart, and comes back up in order to allow for, for motor function at the, at, at the, in the head. Now... In smaller mammals, this isn't a problem because it's a fairly sh short distance. And in, and in giraffes, I'm not going to say it's a problem. What I, what I actually said was that it's not problematic enough to hinder this elongation of the neck. But if it were intelligently designed, how absurd is it to make a nerve 17 feet long or however long it needs to be as opposed to, you know, 6, 8 inches long? Right, well, right. I understand what you're saying from a human point of view, but the problem is it's efficiently not, and effectively, you know, it's, it's not a human the point same, of view. whether it's whether it's it's longer or short. It's not a human point of view. It's, a, what's wrong, it's about what's wrong it's with a, it being longer. It's about intelligent design. Well, first of all, um, 
signals take a certain amount of time to travel. It's relatively, uh, you know, not a huge deal. The question is, if you're intelligently designing something, why would you intentionally design a nerve that runs all the way down here for no reason? It doesn't do anything in the intervening space underneath the aorta and all the way back up to the neck when you could just go straight across. Isn't that, less, isn't that the least optimum path? And isn't it something that if you were the intelligent designer, not only would you not want to do it because it's not optimum, but mm -hmm. also it gives those people who begin to dissect animals the exact wrong impression? Because it, right. it is exactly what happens when a species that used to have a shorter neck over time has a longer neck. I hear, but if the criteria is only on uh, efficiency, then we should all be one or uh, one-celled organisms. That's the most efficient of all. There's no need wow. to you know, well, get no, nothing. no. I mean, you don't have to go to the extremes. It's a simple comparison between two options. It's. It, it, I'm not going to get mired into the absurdity of oh, if it's only about efficiency. I'm saying that there that, that there's no reason for that nerve that we can identify to go all the way down there, other than the ancestors of that creature that had shorter necks, it, it went along there as well. So where do you draw the line between the viable options and the ultimate efficiency? That's what I don't know. Uh, I'm not drawing options between ultimate efficiency and viable options. I'm pointing out that the nerve of this particular creature is entirely consistent with a change in species over time and seems absurd in the face of a claim of intelligent design. Do you not agree that that's an absurd design? Right. I mean, I, I, I'd like to stick on the point of what, what perspective are we taking from when you say absurd? You know, efficiency is the criteria you're basing it on? I'm not, I didn't, I'm not limiting it to a single... Do you agree that that would be an absurd design? Only in that's regards to efficiency, if you want to make it be from point A to point B in the shortest amount of time, yes. But there's no need for it to be quickly. Well, the point is that, that people introduce intelligent design wow. into the conversation by saying, look, everything is so brilliantly, you know, is, is so perfectly made that uh, some intelligence uh, deciding how everything should be laid out uh, must be it. Uh, I, I mean, is the only possible explanation. Evolution is an explanation that people have figured out is, uh, you know, based on various lines of evidence, is probably the way things did actually happen. Um, but people who, uh, re who would like to, uh, to have scientific basis for God say, well, we can recognize uh, good design in all these living things. So if you think that you can recognize good design then it's a cop out to say that you're that you're suspending judgment because because you're basically begging the question when you say everything i see that looks good to me has to be the product of an intelligence and everything that uh looks bad to me well i probably just don't understand it well enough yet. if your cable company came to your house and ran the cable from from the the sidewalk in front of your house in a zigzag pattern through your front yard, around your neighbor's house, and came back to your house, would you not say that's a rather dumb thing for them to do just because they didn't have any, any, any use to not take that route? Especially if your neighbor's fence post happened to cut your cable one day. I mean, isn't, isn't the longer something is, the more risky it becomes, the more in, prone in to damage case, it becomes? In that case, I agree with it, but only because it's in an unshielded environment outside. You know, it can get weather damage, people can run over it. Okay, but if it's okay, inside the stop. house, wound around the basement, who cares how many times it's wound around? It works. Really, really. So if your cable company came in, and instead of wire, when, when the cable comes in your house and they had to spread it out to each of the rooms, if they did eight laps around the basement and then went up to the attic and then split it off and ran it to I'm, all the different... I'm not saying it's stringent. I'm just saying it would work the same as if they did it once. That, 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 that's the thing. The criteria, I agree with you that, you know, you're saying efficiency equals intelligence. But no. I would like to know the, cri the criteria that it's, that, it's, that it's being based on. You know, you could I'm say, not, like, I, like I said... I'm not simply saying efficiency. Okay, so what are the other ones you're saying? I, I, I'm not listing them. You are. I'm, I'm okay, asking um, you, I'm ask, I asked you if you agreed that that was poor design. 
But I said if it was outside and it could be destroyed, then... It doesn't the matter if it's too. outside. The longer something is, the more likely it is to have some sort of accident. The more raw freaking surface area there is to potentially damage. What, what about that is so difficult? Well, and not only that, but no, it costs I, I, more. I agree with that, but I'm saying if it's inside protected, then technically there's no... No, no sir. I said it doesn't matter if it's inside protected. It is still true that there is more potential surface area for damage, and it costs more, as Russell just pointed out. So, so, I, so I agree with that, but then I'd like to say, where do you draw the line between it just being efficient design, or why don't we go to the ultimate extreme and say the perfection of intelligent being to design, we should all be one, one cell organism, and that would be perfect in uh, your eyes. I don't know. It's not. I, because no, I, no because no damage, my position... No, damage, be, there, there are, no there sir, are would you wait? Daniel, Daniel. My position isn't based on the fact that there's an intelligent designer looking for the optimum. I agree with the science that we have evolved, and therefore there are going to be things that are inefficient, because that's what the evidence shows. If we were all one-celled organisms, I guess we wouldn't be having this conversation, but yeah, then we couldn't have any sort of conversation about diversity or design. But the fact that we're not, and the fact that we live in this diverse environment that screams evolution by natural selection, and, and explicitly, in many cases, re, uh, rebuts the idea that there's an intelligent designer. I just can't believe we're having this conversation. I, I hear, and I just want to go back to the to when we first started the conversation. I was talking to your to your friend. I, I understand what you were saying about the gene pool and, and the uh, the heights of, of people, okay. but I'd like I, I want to say that if that is indeed true, it seems that this planet is a very propitious place to be living because the majority of the organisms on here seem to have taken a very consistent stride toward better mutations and more useful adaptations and than the next No, like I was pointing out... That's like not I true if 98% of the species have gone extinct. Well, that's true, but... Um, the, the ones but I mean, the, the ones <laughs> no, that are left alive... Get... <laughs> I mean, all you need is a single abiogenesis event. Uh, if Obviously, any planet on which the abiogenesis event didn't happen will not have any other life. So that's one big criterion right there. Uh, we got to go to the absurdity of this last statement. Because okay. he wants to only pick their survivors and say, look, they've all done a remarkable job of evolving <laughs> beneficial stuff. Yes, if you pick out the 2% that hasn't gone extinct yet, yeah, they've done a really good job of being selected for. Child-bearing well, is heredity. That, but they did not Hereditary. necessarily die because of the bad mutations. Like, you, you know there's a big theory about the, uh, the comet that hit. Right, Those and that's because the fine. ones with they the bad mutations... They were adapted. That's... They adapted well. They, they were in, improving exponentially. And no, they just got yeah. that's no. Not, that's and not that's because no. the ones with the bad mutations all died. And you don't see them anymore. It's, it's not good mutations and bad mutations. Well, it... It's not. The... The... the Selection criteria changed at some point, changed dramatically in many cases where, you know, the K2 event and things like that, and it changed in little ways all the time. It's always changing. The simple fact is that pretty much everything that's alive today will ultimately become an extinct species as well, although we'll continue to have offspring for as long as, I guess, the planet can sustain them unless there is some other cataclysmic event. But when you talk about the fact you saying that, look at what's, you know, what's survived on the planet, it's done a remarkable job. First of all, it's not exponential. I mean, uh, let's, let's be careful with the math that we're throwing around on here. Uh, growth, a, a change, is rather a slow process, and it, because the criteria... Uh, I'm sorry, I, I apologize. I meant majority. I, I shouldn't have said that. The majority of The majority of what? Hmm? Of, of, of the animals seem to be a, a evolving... Uh, for advantageous rather than negative traits. No, they're not. They're not. That's the thing. You're looking at this kind of backwards. You're looking at as, this as if the, the changes are done with some intent to match the criteria that are coming up. Not only do we not necessarily know the criteria, but the change that we're talking about in the case of evolution is not any sort of uh, forethought. It's blind. It is, changes just keep happening, and the criteria also changes. Now, we're fortunate that for the last, you know, 10,000, 200, or 250,000 years or so, however long, the criteria, as far as human beings, have stayed relatively the same. 
the earth hasn't changed dramatically and the environment in which we live hasn't changed dramatically. We've also had the benefit of being the latest in a long series of life forms that have thrived under these conditions. But the conditions could change dramatically tomorrow and then we go extinct just like 98% of the species that have ever lived on the planet or whatever the percentage is. So it's, it's not, there's no direction to this process. Mm -hmm. it, 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 although I'm, 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 I'm pretty sure if I remember reading correctly that the mutations or other cells, cells are designed to mutate, uh, to mimic themselves 100% accurately. So if there's a mutation, it's more That's likely to be a, a negative mutation like cancer than a, a positive mutation. Is that correct? That's just a feature of DNA. The, um, the, the very, very early in the development of life uh, what was material that's able to replicate itself. And that's kind of what abiogenesis is all about, is coming up, uh, is seeing in what ways things are able to make copies of themselves. But once you have that, then the process of variation and, uh, and moving in what we see in hindsight as a positive direction toward us uh, kicks in. And it's not all mutations or variations in the direction of survival. It's just that the ones that, uh, that happen to go the wrong way are the ones that you don't see now because they're dead. And, and you refer to cancer as a negative mutation, a bad mutation. It's not. It's really good for the cancer. I mean, it's, you're, looking at the, you're looking at it and judging it as good or bad. Well, well, that, that's, let so me finish, me, Daniel. Daniel, Daniel, well. Daniel, let me finish. Yeah. You're looking at it as good or bad with respect to our point of view. That's fine. I'm happy to say all day long that from the human point of view, <laughs> cancer is a really bad thing, uh, along with lots of other things. It, it, evolution doesn't give a crap about our point of view. It's not a thing. It doesn't think. It doesn't care. There's no point of view is preferred. Only what is actually naturally occurring. And that's why viruses and bacteria and things that are deadly to us are, are demonstrations of incredibly good mutations for the bacteria. Survival. I agree with that, but then eventually the cancer dies as well. Sure. Eventually everything's going to die. What's the point? No, when it kills the organism that it's growing in. Well, okay, cancer is an exception because cancer is uh, not, a, not a living separate thing. It's a mutation of cells within us. Cancer is okay, a okay. problem with our own, you know, genetic development. That's what I mean, right. Genetic development can sometimes cause problems more than, more than advantages. You're, you're, no, cancer doesn't count. It's not a separate life form. It, you can't, you, you're comparing apples and oranges. It's a, it's a mutation of, the, of, the, of, of our, our cells. Yes, but it's not, an, it's not an organism or an entity unto itself. It is a problem with our genetic code. Okay, okay. I, I, I don't want to use up much more of your guys' time. I know I took a long time. I appreciate you talking to me. I just want to say one last thing that I realize sometimes uh, religious people, they get tied up in defending their views very vehemently and sometimes angrily or aggressively because if, if there's, there's no way around this, the following uh, explanation, and I believe you'll say it's true, that if evolution is wrong, then there's basically no other prudent explanation at this time so other what? than a god. And well, if there's no god, so, so then what? evolution is basically correct. Um, so, no. Yeah, so I'm no. Yeah? Uh, first of all, if evolution were untrue and we had no explanation, so what? That doesn't lend any credence at all to the god explanation. Correct. correct. Okay? Number two, we already know that evolution is true. Right. Well, there's a difference between microevolution and macroevolution. Micro no, there's not. Is, no, there's not. True. No, there's not. That's a fiction invented by creationists. You talk to evolutionary sci scientists; they're not going to make distinctions between this micro and macro crap. That is that is a fiction that is generated by creationists. Okay, it's, it's, uh, I hear, but I, I, the, the point I brought up by saying whether evolution and, and, the, and theology, uh, why, they, why they clash so often. Yeah, it's because, that, it's because the theo theologians are positing something for which they have no evidence. Right, so I'm, I'm not, I'm not um, asserting that even if evolution was proved wrong, that proves God, no. But I am saying the, the, the amazing complexity, if, there, if evolution was proved false, it would be a real problem to explain. No, it's not. some type of, of, yeah. of intelligence. But apparently, no, it's, it's not. <laughs> it's not hard to explain without some kind of ev evidence, without some kind of intelligence. Yeah, it's not was proven wrong. Proven wrong, I think. Um, it would be difficult. Okay, first of all, uh, wow.
the the intelligence apparently would not need any kind of explanation as far as you're concerned, right? If we found out that there was a god tomorrow, you wouldn't say to yourself, uh, "Gosh, here's an incredibly big, complicated mind that's more uh, that's more complex than anything else on the earth." Uh, better come up with a scientific reason uh, where that come from, came from. Complexi right, I, I, complexity is not a complexity is not a factor in recognizing design. Sorry to right. say. Right, I, I've 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 heard that before, but the, the, I don't want to get into the essence of what you know the mind okay. of God could really be. That's not part of what, what we can discuss. Right, but because I, you'd I, rather I make up an point, explanation and have it be the treated why as the acceptable because you see alternative. That they are basically. But this is the ultimate theory, just like the ultimate theory. No, it's not a theory. theory. It's not a theory. It's not an alternate anything other than wild ass assertion. A theory. I a theory. I should say ideologies, just like these two ideologies are the ultimate. As in, for example, in physics, string theory, as I'm sure you're aware of, is basically the ultimate theory. It combines, you know, all the. Components I'm, I'm not of, convinced that string theory actually counts as a theory yet, and I don't want it to get off on a on a tangent about that because it's irrelevant to this discussion. <laughs> the fact of the matter is that evolution is a scientific theory, and the creationist assertions, or even the theistic assertions, are just wild ass assertions without supporting evidence. There's a distinction there. We don't get to label that a theory. We barely get to label that a wild ass guess. Okay, so, so what I'm just, my point what I'm trying to make is that the theologians, sometimes they don't realize that they have so much invested in this ideology that they start personally defending it. And I'd like to bring the same point that sometimes atheists, they're so back behind evolution, they don't realize how much emotions they've invested in it, and that leads them to sometimes defend it very vehemently as well. No, sir, you're just wrong. I don't defend evolution passionately uh, because I'm... Are. Because, because, would you let me finish... Sure. I don't do it because I'm emotionally invested in evolution. I do it because I'm passionate about the truth, and I am outright just flabbergasted by the amount of pe the number of people who assert things without evidence and want to try to claim that their view is just as valid as anybody else's, and you can't prove me wrong, so ha, ha, ha. And while I actually give a shit about whether or not something's true, and the I theists don't. I, I agree with that, and, and during this whole conversation, I never once asserted that God is true or that you have to believe in him or anything. I, I, I didn't say you did. That, hmm? I never said you did. Right, I'm just saying I, that... Are you, you just trying to some... get points at the end for not doing something? I'm sorry? Are you just trying to earn points at the end for not doing something? You believe in a God, right? No, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to earn points. I was just trying to Do bring you... the point that you see how few, few, uh, just like religious people, they have a lot invested in it. And that's why they said that, you know, they're, they're, I it's, have, it's not just, it's not just another debate that you're you know, wrong. sit over drinking tea. You're wrong, it's sir. The, you're wrong, sir. You're confusing passion with defending something and extrapolating to the basis of that passion. Religious people are often fervent in defending their beliefs, but they've accepted those beliefs for no good reason and they cannot defend them. This is, this is akin to you calling my mother a whore and me saying, no, that's not true. And you say, well, you can't prove me wrong because you weren't sleeping with her. Unfortunately, we're completely out of time. Uh, and we'll try to work maybe towards truth next week. Thanks so much for the call. We'll see you all some Thanks. of you at dinner. Bye, everyone. Bye -bye. Have a good night, guys. That's fine. <laughs> well, I don't have anything else to say now. <laughs> Just um, smile at the camera? No, screw the camera. <laughs> we'll see you guys next week. Bye.